There is a lot of lore hidden in the long dark, some of which is only recoverable when the lights turn back on. The town of Milton, while long forgotten, is filled with many buffer memories scattered across the town. These buffer memories expand on the state of the town following the collapse, showing us the loneliness and hardships of being abandoned by the world. In part one of Memories of Milton, I went through the Milton Credit Union buffer memories. In part two, this video, I will go through the Milton Post Office and Orca Gas Station memories. Before I continue, please make sure to comment, like, share, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so I can keep making videos like this. First, I should mention that the buffer memories for the Milton Post Office and Orca Gas Station are much shorter than the memories of the Milton Credit Union. Because of this, I will be reading all the buffer memories of each location and then breaking them down instead of one by one. Milton Post Office, Chris. Mail today, first piece in three days. All the way from the East Coast, even. Gives me something to do, finally. Higgins wasn't at his spot this morning. Odd. I can't remember the last time that happened. After three years here, it's starting to feel like home. Still, we get fewer and fewer pieces of mail. For all the letter-writing folks in Milton get up to, it's a shame they receive so few responses. A small package came in this morning and it's been in shipping limbo for a while, by the looks of it. No surprise these days but a minor miracle it got all the way here from Toronto. If freight is opened back up again, that's a great sign. These buffer memories offer very little new information about Milton itself, but do reinforce the abandoned state that the town found itself in after the collapse. Mail delivery to Milton was incredibly slow, and that is most likely due to the fact that barely any mail is sent to the remote town. Packages arrive much later, most likely due to fuel shortages and the cost of shipping heavier items. The saddest part is how little mail Milton was getting for how much it was sending out. Almost like the neighbors that did move away, or the family of the people that remained, abandoned the town. The game's wiki lists Higgins as a post office worker. No matter their profession, it sounds like Higgins most likely left the island at some point in time. Also, these buffer memories tell us that Chris, the writer, moved to Milton after the collapse. This is most likely due to the need of a postal worker to service the town. I doubt Chris made the decision to move to Great Bear Island on his own given the state of the world. So this was most likely his only choice for employment. Orca Gas Station, Peter Good. Subject, how are things? From Peter Good to Dan Presnell. Hi Dan, hope you are well. Have you had any luck getting any pharmaceuticals delivered out there in the valley? My usual mainland contact has stopped returning my calls and emails. Supplies are low, and people are starting to notice the delay. Subject, school trip, from Dak to Peter Good. 15 candy bars, 10 packets of beef jerky, 5 cans of peaches, 15 bottles of water. Who knew kids could eat this much in a weekend? Add this to the next order, please. Subject, please, from Peter Good to Depot 23. Antibiotics, painkillers, antiseptic, whatever you have, we're down to nothing and it's all my fault. Subject, patience. From Peter Good to Hank McDermott. Hank, I can barely get dog food delivered out this far right now. Quit asking me to restock the beer fridge. You'll just have to wait like the rest of us. Believe me, when they arrive, I'll buy you one myself. Peter. Things are dire on Great Bear Island. It is known from the post-collapse lore that simple commodities would become incredibly hard to get. From peaches and coffee to pharmaceuticals and dog food, stores across the island would become more barren. Supply lines would fade away, slowly adding to the growing independence movement on the island. Without these supply lines, many people would begin to rely on themselves and their neighbors to continue living. Dan here is the owner of the rural store in Thompson's Crossing in Pleasant Valley. His buffer memories offer similar stories of the hardships of running a store on a remote island. Barbara's buffer memories from the Quonset garage are the same. With fewer supply lines and fewer deliveries, everything essential would be harder to acquire and everything non-essential would disappear from the island entirely. This would be a canon reason why alcoholic drinks are nowhere to be seen on Great Bear Island. From these buffer memories left behind by Anika, Chris, and Peter of Milton, we can see how difficult life was in a town that was already long forgotten before the collapse. The collapse would only make things worse, forcing more people to move away, effectively shutting down public services, and leaving the town with nothing to survive off of. From its economic rise and fall, to the demographic exodus, to the night of the lights in the wake of the quiet apocalypse, 
Milton's story is long, sad, and ends with an electric spark. This video not only marks the end of Memories of Milton, but also the story of Milton in general. If you want to know the whole history and story of Milton, check out The History of Milton, The Life of Grey Mother, The Night of the Lights, Do Not Go Gentle, and Memories of Milton Part 1. All these videos are linked below in the new The Long Dark, The History of Milton playlist. If you enjoyed this video, please make sure to comment, like, share, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so I can keep making them.